This episode contains discussion of murder, gun violence, and stabbing. Your discretion is advised. In the late 1960s throughout Northern California, the general public was on edge. There were five deaths confirmed to be at the hands of the Zodiac, with two more injured. Zodiac would later claim responsibility for 37 deaths, although those claims have never been proven to be true. The case of the Zodiac Killer has gone down in U.S. history as the most notorious unsolved case, as his identity remains a mystery to this day. Although some claim to have solved the case of his identity, no one has ever been arrested and charged with the crimes he's taken credit for. We're doing it. Zodiac. I know. This is one of the heaviest requested cases that we've ever done. Um, so we want to give a Hey Girl thanks to, and this is the list, y'all, Valerie Queen, yeah. Michaela Elizabeth Brizzle, Kyle Metcalf, Lauren Gonzalez, Lauren Claire, Maria Carvalho, Harriet Johnstone, and Katie Wigd. Widgham Okay. Sure. I've given that one some thought. No, I messed it up, but. We're doing the best we can here. Um, And, of course, thank you to Mark for writing this one up. Yay! All right. So, before we jump into the case today, we just want to kind of touch base on this case as a whole. So, it's, like we said, one of our most requested cases. Um, It's been covered in a ton of different places. So, you've got podcasts you can watch. You've got... You can't watch podcasts. (laughs) How old are you? How elderly is what happened. Where can I watch your podcast? Um, I mean, I guess if you're watching this, it's <laughs> whatever. All right. My bad. You've got you podcasts. A podcast? yep. Yeah. You can listen to, or you can watch stuff on YouTube. Uh, you can watch a documentary. I know you can watch that. Um, there's books you can read. Like, there's movies based on There's all kinds of stuff, right? Um, there are people who have made their entire career just out of this one case alone. Like there are there are podcast series on it where that's all they cover is just like multiple episodes on this. So we are not going to be able to go through all the information that's out there. I mean, this is the one hour show, right? So to start, we'll just lay out, you know, what this episode will and it won't be. Um, This case is one of those that has like so many different little like rabbit holes you can go down and, you know, you could spend an entire day on Reddit. Um, You like pull one thread. The next thing you know, you've been watching YouTube all day. You haven't showered, still in your PJs. You wake up and it's five in the afternoon. Like you don't know what's going on, right? Um, So we're going to go over victims and crimes that are considered confirmed to be attributed to Zodiac. We'll dive into the letters and ciphers that he sent to the police and media. And then we'll take a look at some of the more popular or likely suspects. We're not going to sit here and solve this case today. And we're not going to solve any cases, by the way. We're not investigators. Um, At the end, we're not going to have this big revelation and say, you know, we can prove without a doubt that your mom is Jack Russell is the Zodiac killer. We don't know that. No one can know that. Right. Um, No. But maybe as we go along, we'll learn something new about the case and why it's considered to be one of the most notorious unsolved mysteries in the U.S. and the world. You know how much I love an unsolved case? It's Tori's favorite. They're tough. I'm sorry. I know. They're tough. <laughs> yeah. No closure. No closure. It's unsolved for like 60 years. Ugh. That's rough stuff. That's rough stuff. It also hurts my feelings that the 60s yeah. were that long ago. It's just like the 60s, only with less hope. Tell me about it. Yes. Not that we were like around to see it, but still. I know, but like the 60s were 30 the years 90s. ago for me. Yeah. And they just stayed there. But. I know. Listen, I don't think it's a secret. I don't know if anybody knows this. I love the 90s. Um, Just watched Spice World last night. Okay? So, I'm all about the 90s. That's where I live. That's where I will die. That's it for me. So, the 90s are now. Yep. Uh, Betty Lou Jensen and David Arthur Faraday were both murdered in December of 1968. They are considered by most to be Zodiac's first victims. David and Betty were out on their first date the night they were killed. This was Betty Lou Jensen's first date ever. I don't know about David, but I know it was, that's what I read. (sighs) When looking into their deaths, there are two different stories of what they did that night. One was that they went to go to a Christmas concert at the high school near Betty's home, and then afterward they went for a drive and they ended up on Lake Herman Road. 
The other story is that they decided to go visit a friend of theirs for a while and then go to a local restaurant to have dinner. After eating, they went for a drive. So in both stories, David and Betty Lou end up on Lake Herman Road around 10.15 p.m. David pulled his mother's rambler onto a small gravel side road, and it was a known, like, make-out point. They often refer to it as a lover's lane. Um, This is where teens often would park their cars to discuss politics. (laughs) Right. Talk about their commitment to community service. You need, you have to have a designated place to do that where nobody else can see what you're doing. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's a private matter. Um, It's really unclear and unknown exactly what happened after they pulled off to Lake Herman Road. Um, You know, this is the late 60s, so forensics that we know today weren't even a twinkle in our little eyes, were they? Uh, What is known is that by 11.20 p.m. that they were both dead. Their bodies were discovered by Stella Borges, who lived about a mile and a half away from the gravel road pull-off. She found their bodies outside of the car and quickly jumped in her car. She raced to town to get authorities. No cell phones, so you gotta wait till you can call somebody. She ran into a captain while driving, and by 11.28 p.m., he was on the scene. So David was found lying near the car's right passenger wheel. He had suffered a gunshot to the left side of his head. He was still breathing. He was rushed from the scene to the nearest hospital, but unfortunately was pronounced dead on arrival at 12.05 a.m. Investigators' thoughts are that Betty Lou exited the passenger side of the vehicle and tried to run away, either of her own volition or ordered by the killer. She made it 33 feet from the Rambler when she was gunned down. She had five gunshot wounds to her back. She stumbled for a few seconds and then she fell backwards. And when authorities arrived on the scene initially, Betty Lou had already passed away. There were two bullet holes in the Rambler that David drove suspected to be warning shots. There were witnesses who claimed that they saw two cars parked by each other around the time that the murders took place. The witness estimated that he drove by the scene around 11.14 p.m. on his way into the graveyard shift that he was working. And he said that he saw the two cars parked, but he didn't see anyone. He couldn't give a maker model of the cars, but in a police report said that about 30 seconds or so after he passed, he heard what could have been a gunshot. Another set of witnesses passed through the area at 11 p.m. and saw two people in the Rambler, a boy and a girl, presumably Betty Lou and David. And with very little evidence to go on, um, investigators begin their search for the killer. In July of 1969, Michael Majot and Darlene Farron pulled into Blue Rock Springs Park in Vallejo, California. It had been about six months since David and Betty Lou were murdered, about four miles from where Michael and Darlene were. It was just before midnight on July 4th when they parked. While they sat in Darlene's car, a second car drove up and parked beside them. After sitting for only a few moments, though, the car quickly drove away. Ten minutes later, though, it returned and parked right behind Michael and Darlene. As soon as the man stopped and parked, he was out of the car and making his way to the passenger side of the car. He had a high-powered flashlight, and from inside, he appeared to be a police officer because of the way that he moved and his demeanor. It wouldn't be out of the norm for a police officer to show up and run a young couple off while they were parked, um, possibly, you know, getting up to no good, talking about the issues, um, maybe smoking a little of the devil's lettuce. We don't know what people are doing, but we, don't, we think that's bad. Michael fumbled inside. We think that's very bad. Um, and, you know. It's not uncommon, but Michael, he's fumbling for his ID. He's expecting the officer to ask for it. But while he's looking, the man raised a 9mm handgun and fired five shots into the car, striking both Michael and Darlene. Michael quickly tried to jump into the back seat of the car as the man shot, and after the five shots, the man walked away. But as, as he was walking away, though, Michael calls out for help, and this drew the attention of the shooter back to him, who went back and fired two more shots into each Darlene and Michael. About 800 feet from where the young couple was shot sat the house of the park's caretaker. His son, George Bryant, called that or recalled that night that he heard some fireworks going off, then they stopped. A short time after that, he heard what appeared to be gunshots, much louder than the firecrackers earlier. And after a few moments, more shots rang out, and this was followed by a car driving away at a high speed. He wasn't sure which way it went, though. The gunshots were reported, and officers began to show up and investigate, and they found Michael and Darlene both shot. One officer rushed to Darlene and asked 
asked her what happened. And she was in shock from her injuries, obviously, and he was unable to make out what she was trying to say. Both were rushed to the hospital. The ambulance crew worked tirelessly as they sped to the hospital, but Darlene Farron was pronounced dead on arrival at 12.38 a.m. at Kaiser Hospital. So, I don't know what you want to call it. It's um, incredibly lucky or like a, a miracle, but Michael survived. And he was still in the hospital, but he was able to give inve investigators a description of the assailant. So he described a heavy set man around 5'8", five, 5 five feet 8 inches tall. He said that the man was big, but not fat, not blubbery. Um, and he estimated that he was around 195 to 200 pounds. This is crazy to me because I will never, if I see anybody, I, I can never be like, I think he was about 5'8", mm -mm. and approximately seven million pounds like I, that, I don't know pounds i don't know height i don't taller than me mm -mm. bigger than like i don't I know have no idea either no but i mean good for I him know. but he said that the man didn't have or he said that the man had short light brown almost blonde curly hair and he said that the man did not have glasses but he made it a point to say that the man's face was large like he went out of his way to say this guy has a particularly large face big old face a huge face. Like, I don't know. What are we, Mr. Potato Head? Are we, I don't. Oh, uh, yeah. All face. Bobble nobody, head? No. Yeah. I don't know. At 1240 a.m. on July 5th, less than an hour after the attack, a call was received at the Vallejo Police Department, and it was later traced to a payphone that was actually near Darlene Farron's home. So while she didn't know it at the time, the 26-year-old dispatcher who took the call would become one of only three people to talk to the Zodiac Killer. She said that the caller spoke in a monotone, rehearsed fashion, saying, I'm going to try it. I want to report a double murder. If you will go one mile east on Columbus Parkway to the public park, you will find the kids in a brown car. They were shot with a 9mm Luger. And also, I killed the kids last year. Goodbye. Yay! Award Thank winning. You. I tried. Yep. I don't know. And the kids last year that he's referring to are David and Betty Lou. All right. Now we're going to head to Lake Berryessa. In September of 1969, between two and three months after Darlene was murdered and Michael was shot, Brian Hardnell and Cecilia Shepard were picnicking at Lake Berryessa. As they sat on a blanket enjoying the afternoon, Cecilia saw a man about two to three hundred yards away. And he was acting strangely. It looked like he was watching them which is like super weird. He had completely yeah. stopped walking and he was just staring at them. Um, they tried to enjoy their day. They tried to talk some more. Like Brian said, he just sort of was like, I mean, you know, other people can come here. It's a public place. Like, I'm sure it's nothing, yeah. you know? Um, well, and it's, this is the middle of the day. Yeah. You definitely don't, you know, feel like, you know, yeah, no, mm -hmm. So they kind of blow it off. Um, and then they look back up and he's much closer. He's like 75 feet away. They're looking for him. And then he disappears. And he go he like ducks behind a tree. Which is really weird. Like really weird. Very. Um, yeah. And then a few moments later, she finds him. So he goes behind that tree and he puts on like a costume. So when he comes back out from behind the tree, he's wearing like an executioner style hood with clip on sunglasses over the eyes. On the front, he wore some kind of like a like bib style garment. It had a white circle with crosshairs in the middle, um, which are now recognized by many as the Zodiac crosshairs. And as he approached, Celia told Brian, oh my God, he's got a gun. The hooded man told the couple that he was an escaped convict from either Montana or Colorado. Both have been reported. He claimed to have killed a prison guard and stolen his car. He told him he needed their car. He needed money. Um, he needed to get to Mexico. He was just trying to escape, right? Since the car he was driving was too hot. Um, he also had... What does that mean, too hot? Is it like they they know that he's in that car? Is that yeah, what that means? Yeah, like they're they're on to me. He's like oh. feeling the heat or whatever. I didn't know if it was like right said Fred, like I'm too sexy. Please. Like my car's just too. That's like too hot. 
It's just too hot. It's too yeah. it's too cute. Might be. Yeah. yeah. He had pre-cut lengths of clothesline or rope, and he told Cecilia to tie Brian up, and then he tied her up. After tying her up, he checked Brian's hands and tied them tighter, suspecting that Cecilia had left them loose so he could escape. As they were laying on the ground hogtied, Brian asked the man if the gun was even loaded. And in response, the man pulled it out and removed the magazine and showed Brian it indeed was loaded. And Brian didn't have a lot of cash on him. He said all he had was change. He's like, take it, take keys to my car, whatever. The man doesn't take any of this stuff. That's scary because you're like, he's saying that's all he wants and he won't take it now. Right. So what does he actually want? Um. So, you know, they were definitely hoping that he would just take the stuff and walk away and like, yeah, it's scary, but we're going to be okay. And not only does he not take the items, but he pulls out a knife, a huge knife. And he started to stab both of them. Uh, Brian was stabbed six times while Cecilia was stabbed 10 times. Brian stopped breathing in an effort to pretend to be dead, hoping that the man would leave. Uh, He walked away. He found their car and drew the Zodiac crosshair on the door in marker. And he also wrote Vallejo 122268, 7469, September 27th, 69, 630 by knife. So he's writing down the dates of the attacks that he has committed. Right. Because proud. Yeah, I was going to say, he's very proud of these awful, heinous things that he's He's doing to- Zodiac was here. (laughs) Yeah. Like, gross. Yeah, it's super gross. Um, So after he walked away, Brian and Cecilia actually got out of their, like, being tied up. Um, There was a man on the lake fishing, and he heard them yelling for help. And so he came to their aid. Um, Park rangers were called to the scene, who then called the police and an ambulance. Around 740, both Brian and Cecilia were being treated by first responders, and they both gave statements about the events that occurred. While they were being treated, though, a call came into the Napa Police Department. And when the dispatcher answered the call, he heard the following. Do it. I want to report a murder. No, a double murder. They are two miles north of Park Headquarters. They were in a white Volkswagen Carmen Gia? Gia? Karma Gia? Never heard of her. I don't know. I don't know what kind of car that is. Uh, the man paused for a moment and then said, I'm the one that did it. You did great. It sounded like a computer recording. That's what I was going for. I'm going to say that's what I was going for. Yeah. Police <laughs> traced where the call came from and they found a payphone by a car wash. The receiver dangled and the phone was off the hook. It's like ominous. Uh, It was about 30 miles from the crime scene, but only a couple blocks from the sheriff's office. He's bold, isn't Uh, he? Detectives were able to get a palm print off the receiver, but have never matched it to a suspect. Two days after the attack, Cecilia was in the hospital and unfortunately succumbed to her injuries. Uh, She died from extensive internal and external hemorrhage from the knife wounds. Brian Hartnell survived the attack and worked with investigators to give as many details as he could recall. It's just amazing that yeah. anybody survived any of the attacks. But that also what's really made. interesting is that the females don't ever survive. It's the males. And the females yeah. are sustaining significantly more injuries than the males are. Which like Well, yeah, I mean, it's a wonder that the the second attack that he made, the male was shot once in the head, which... Grave, yeah. She was shot five times. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then Cecilia... Or this was the first attack, excuse me, the first attack. Right. Cecilia was stabbed almost double the amount of times that Brian was. So it seems to, like, things that I've read um, and watched and, you know, FBI profilers and all these people talking about it, they say... This points to a severe hatred of women. It could be possibly that he never had a relationship of his own and he was jealous of, you know, people at Lover's Lanes and having these like picnics and, you know, blah, 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 whatever. So he's like taking it out on people who are happy. Go get a girlfriend. Like, quit. I just don't. I don't. Like, there's somebody for everybody. You might be a 
fucking weirdo, but there's another fucking weirdo out there who thinks you're just the bee's knees. It really is. Two weeks after the Lake Berryessa attack, a white male passenger entered a taxi on the intersection of Mason and Geary, Geary Streets in San Francisco. He requested a ride to Washington and Maple in Presidio Heights, and the driver, who was 29-year-old Paul Stein, didn't think anything of it and set out on the way. So Paul drove about a block past Maple Street, and whether he did this on his own or he was instructed to, we have no idea. But the passenger brought out a 9mm firearm and shot Paul in the head. Just like gun to the back Why? of his head. Yeah. It so senseless. The passenger then took Paul's keys wallet and cut a piece from his bloodstained shirt to take with him. There were three teenagers across the street from where the murder took place and witnessed the man take the piece of the shirt and wipe down the car before fleeing. Before he left, he also wiped down the front, right front passenger door and driver's side door handles. And the teenage boys called the police. The teens described the man as a white adult male, probably in his early 40s with a heavy build, and they described red, reddish blonde crew cut hair with eyeglasses. First of all, can I just say, yeah, good on these teenage boys, you know, like the, that feeling of like, I don't know if I should call, like, what if I'm misunderstanding what I'm seeing? And like, what if I'm making a video of nothing? Or maybe somebody's already called, like all that kind of goes through people's minds, but they did what they needed to do. And we know that this was a, a white adult male with reddish blonde hair, but, but what do they tell? What does that, um, information get what happens after yeah, that this is like telephone game with a toddler mm -hmm. so apparently even though they gave like a stellar description the information given to patrolling officers at the scene was completely wrong so whether it was poor communication misinterpretation something i don't know somebody got their wires crossed i don't know what happened but the police were dispatched to be on the lookout for a black male adult where did that How come does that from how did anybody get that? I've and of course, now they they're not looking for the right suspect. So they're I mean, he slipped through their fingers. It's just it's so sad. And it's so sad. At one point, responding officers saw a man about 5'10, um, thir 35 to 45 years old, and 180 to 200 pounds walking near Jackson and Maple Street. But since they were told to look for a black man, they didn't stop him. Could have been him. Yeah. Well, I also, I also heard a report that they did stop this man that they saw and asked him, did you see, or did you hear any gunshots or did you see anybody looking suspicious? And he's like, oh, I saw a man with a gun running off that way. And they were like, great, thank you, bye. Like, he definitely, yeah, yeah. Okay, so. It's, well, in one of his calls or his letters, he says that that happened. Yes, yeah. So. I, I feel like, especially at that time, not that this has gone away by any means, but I feel like somebody who heard somebody was shot in a cab just had some preconceived notions and said, well, it must have been a black man. I, I mean, I don't know, but I feel like right. that's what's... Because how do you get white adult male with reddish blonde hair... Tra how does that curly hair uh -huh. it does not sound in any way shape or form like blackmail it just doesn't no not at all maybe it's prejudice at play i don't know i it's just it's so unfortunate because now look where we are you know still unsolved he, yeah eyewitnesses said that the man exited the cab and nonchalantly walked up the street and around the same time two officers were who were patrolling the area um they got a call of the shooting and they began to head towards the scene and one recalled seeing a white man with the crew cut wearing a navy jacket and like rust or brown colored trousers um, both of which were described to the dispatcher by the teens and initially paul stein's murder was thought to just be a random robbery but that would change okay so we're gonna jump back a little bit to go over some of the things that zodiac mailed to various locations over the years and this is highly highly unusual a serial killer um, to reach out to the media, especially as many times as he did. I think that really speaks to his ego. Um, you know, yeah. 
please pick me. I'm the one. I'm well, the one that did I mean, it. yeah, like everywhere that he went, like you said, he was like, Zodiac was here. Mm-hmm. Let me sign your crack. Yeah, like exactly. So on July 31st, 1969, the Vallejo Times Herald, San Francisco Examiner, and San Francisco Chronicle all received letters from Zodiac. It's also super weird that he sent it to multiple locations. Um, Each letter was similar in contents and all claimed that he was responsible for the Lake Herman Road and Blue Rock Springs attacks. Dear Editor, This is the murderer of the two teenagers last Christmas at Lake Herman and the girl on the 4th of July near the golf course in Vallejo. To prove I killed them, I shall state some facts which I and only the police know. Christmas, which he spelled incorrectly. Uh, One brand name. Lots of grammatical errors here. But like simple words, grammatical errors, fairly simple words. Some of the more difficult words. He spells spot on. You know, this is not my husband who can't spell the word vinegar, bleach, or box. This is... (laughs) He can spell some things really well. Which also, I'm confused how my husband does really good in Wordle every day when the man can't spell. But anyway. Um, So, Christmas was misspelled with two S's. He says one brand name of ammo, Super X... Number two is 10 shots are fired. Number three, the boy was on his back with his feet to the car. Number four, the girl was on the right side, feet to the west. Fourth of July. This is Blue Rock Springs. One, girl was wearing pattern slacks. Pattern is misspelled. Number two, the boy was also shot in the knee. Number three, brand name of ammo was Western. Here is a part of a cipher. The other two parts of the cipher are being mailed to the editors of the Vallejo Times and San Francisco Examiner. I want you to print the cipher on the front page of your paper. In this cipher is my identity, but he spells that wrong. He misses the, it's identity. uh If you do not print this cipher by the afternoon of Fry, 1st of August, 69, Fry, F-R-Y. It's not Friday, like the day in which we fry things. It's Friday with an I. Um, I will go on a kill ram page. Fry night. Rampage has a f***ing hyphen in it. And fry is, again, the day in which and we fry page. Things. Yeah, but page is... Capital the letter. P is capital. I think he's just f***ing with us. You know? Trying to misspell it. I will... Cr- That's so Zodiac, you know I what know, I mean? Zodiac. I will cruise around C-R-U-S-E... All weekend, killing lone people in the night, then move on to kill again until I end up with a dozen people over the weekend. Each letter... I also find it interesting that he will, like, throw in random punctuation, but then the first part is a complete run-on sentence. I'm like, wait, willy-nilly with these guys? Like, totally. Yeah. As my youngest son would say, not a questionmation mark in sight. A questionmation mark. He's like, oh, a question mark. <laughs> yeah. I love it. Exclamation and question <laughs> together. Question mark. Perfect. Yeah. Each letter contained part of a cipher containing 136 characters. They are known collectively as the 408 cipher. The letter mailed to the San Francisco Chronicle differed from the other two in one section. In this letter, he specifically stated, in the cipher is my identity. About a week after the cipher was received and published. Yeah, exactly. A week after the cipher was received and published for the public, it was cracked by Donald and Betty Harden. What like a um, fun activity to bring a married couple together. I know. But they flipped the the Zodiac. I know. How? How did they do this? It's like that guy in Armageddon that's like, hey, hey guys, there's an asteroid headed to us. Um, Don't know if you knew this. And I'm like, I am not taking, like, opportunity. Like, I'm not living up to my full potential here. I don't think that I could do it. But I'm not using my time wisely. Oh, yeah, I knew that. I say that every day. Tor's not using her time wisely. Okay. Some might say that looking for vintage toys on eBay is not using your time wisely. But others might say, hey, where the hell did you get that? And may I have the link to it? Okay? Okay. One man's trash. You know what I mean? You're right. You're right. So what they did, I read, was that they, because they solved the cipher, 
And what they did was they assumed that this guy is a fucking narcissist and he's all about his like egotistical whatever. So they looked for, they assumed that it was going to start with the word or the letter I, the word I, I, letter I. Um, so they assumed that the first one was I and then that everywhere they saw that same cipher, they put I. Then they saw double, like a double letter together, what is appear to be the same, you know, symbol twice. And they were like, okay, the most common double letter in the English language is L. So then we've got I, double L, I, and there is, you know, they're putting together this word as killing. So they kind of like process of elimination figured it out. Very smart. I would not know where the fuck to start with that. Mm, same. Like that, it's That's, incredible. Well, it's not only like puzzle solving, but it's also criminal profiling because they're like, He's probably a freaking narcissist. And they were yeah, right. they were totally right. And, you know, in this cipher, he's like, you know, got all these like thoughts and ramblings, but he's also misspelling words again. So that's, I feel like an added layer of difficulty because you're like, okay, well, it's yeah. this word, but if he's spelling it wrong, then what random letter is he plugging in here and trying to figure that out? It's, I mean, it's pretty incredible or not using yeah so then you're like well that it couldn't be cruise because there's an i in cruise yeah and okay like, he just spelled in it one wrong. letter he wrote the word victim v-i-c-t-o-m you know so like how do you know he's gonna do that versus like a u there if it's gonna be you know and how do you know when he's gonna spell a word wrong and when he's not you know like that's crazy see that's he knew i mean there's obviously a rhyme and a reason for it he did it because he didn't want to get found out and it worked well, it didn't work, but you know what I mean? Like, it's it made it difficult. Yeah, for sure. Um, now, he promised multiple times now that his identity was going to be in this letter, but spoiler, it wasn't in there. He was like, What ah. a coward. Yeah, exactly. Like, fuck off. I don't know. I hate him. You made a promise. Mm -hmm. So, you're a murderer and an oath breaker? Wow. Like one dude. Wow. So he did also make references to The Most Dangerous Game, which is a story about a man who falls off a yacht and swims to an abandoned island. This isn't as abandoned as he thought, though. It was owned by a Russian millionaire who hunts him for sport. Good God in heaven. This is like that It's Always Sunny episode. Mm -hmm. You drew first blood and he's got to hunt. Yeah. 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 In the letters, he also claimed that he was collecting souls to be his slaves in the afterlife. He said he would not give his name because it would slow down his collection of the afterlife slaves, of course. I mean, well, you need a certain amount, right? Well, you want to collect, a, it's like uh, Pokemon, you got to catch them all. And if the police are there and they're like, hey, we think that's bad. Mm -hmm. Then, then yeah, or like Pogs. I mean, you need as many as humanly possible. Uh, Pogs? Pogs. Pogs. Who remembers Pogs? I'm gonna pull some out. Slammer. Oh man, my whole life in the third grade was Pogs, dude. Pogs. Who the hell knows how to play them? Yeah, I don't. I don't know that. But I just how remember you, being like, I need all of these. Them? I need so many of them. I need ye as many yin yangs as possible. That's oh, for yeah. sure. There's also a random feather in there. I don't know what that's about. That feels dangerous. Um. To me. Yeah. I know. Um, but anyway, Pogs. So after Paul Stein was murdered, the San Francisco Chronicle received another letter, and this one included a section of Paul Stein's shirt that was taken when he was killed so that he could prove that he is the actual killer. In this letter, he said, quote, I think I shall wipe out a school bus some morning, just shoot out the front tire, and then pick off the kitties as they come bouncing out. Obviously, this led to fear and panic throughout the city. No one took these threats lightly because Zodiac had already proven that he was willing to murder brutally whenever he wanted. I would homeschool my damn kids for the rest of their life after that. Um, mm -hmm. In a second letter regarding the Paul Stein murder, Zodiac stated, quote, P.S. Two cops pulled a goof about three minutes, but there's no you in about. After I left the cab, I was walking down the hill to the park when this cop car pulled up uh huh. See? And and when he says like, and one of them called me over, and he's doing a plus sign. One um, 
Plus, one of them called me over, plus asked if I saw anyone acting suspicious or strange in the last five to 10 minutes. And I said, yes, there was this man who was running, misspelled, by waving, misspelled, a gun, and the cops peeled rubber and went around the corner as I directed them. And all of these just plus signs, plus signs, plus plus signs, like no question mark mark in sight, none, none. I disappeared into the park a block and a half away, never to be seen again. Talk about a run on sentence. Lord of mercy. On November 8th, 1969, another cipher was received from Zodiac, this one consisting of 340 characters. It's dubbed the 340 cipher. For 51 years, it went unsolved. In December of 2020, though, it was solved by a group of private citizens. In the message... Who are these people? I know, these are the same kind of people who, in Don't Fuck With Cats, figured out exactly where he was... I mean, the, these things are incredible. I you know! know. I mean, they're going to um, forums on vacuum cleaners and stuff. Like, I can't even solve a Sudoku. Oh, not even a little bit. Yeah. I mean, I have trouble with some of my kids' crossword puzzles. They get sent from home or from school. So, you know, I got to really think on those. Crosswords are hard, though. Um, But again, to my point before, there's somebody for everybody. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. There's a forum on Reddit. For people who are real into vintage vacuum cleaners. I know. Somebody for everybody. Um, in this message, he claimed that he was not scared of the gas chamber because it would just get him to paradise sooner. But I thought you needed to collect more slaves. Yeah. Don't you want to, like, also, not rush to paradise? Well, and also, if if you're fine with it, then fucking tell us who you are. And also... Um, like spoiler, put your money where your mouth is. Going to paradise, sir. I don't think that's where people like you go. Um, no. the team who cracked the code sent everything to the FBI to verify, and they confirmed that it had been solved. But the cipher itself contained no further clues to Zodiac's identity because Pipsqueak Little is what he is. Yeah, he's a Weenie Hut Junior. Mm-hmm. Zodiac continued to communicate with the media and authorities over the years via letters or greeting cards. In one, he wrote, my name is blank, followed by a 13-character cipher, which has never been solved. Which I uh, I feel like if anybody were to ever solve it, it would be like, my name is none of your beeswax or something. Like, it's he's not going to put his name there. Like, I just no. don't think he will. He sent messages referring to a bomb that he had built or was building. At various times, he wrote and claimed responsibility for various murders or abductions, but these were never confirmed to be committed by Zodiac. The final confirmed Zodiac communication arrived in January of 1974. It praised The Exorcist as, quote, the best satirical comedy that I have ever seen. We get it. He's just You're doing dark. that just to... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He's just trying to be like, um, I think that creepy things are hilarious. Yeah. It's like, shut he's up. He's pulling a when Harry met Sally when he's like, I think about death for hours. I spend hours, days. I, I always read the last page of every book in case I die before I finish it. Like, all right, we get it, dude. Like, <laughs> also, not a competition. Yeah, like, you think about death more than I do. Like, whatever. Um, it included a verse from the Mikado. Uh, which is a comedic opera from 1885 in London. Thank you, Mark. Didn't know that. And an unusual symbol at the bottom, which has never been explained or figured out. In his letters, Zodiac had been ending with a score count of sorts. Example, Zodiac equals 10, SFPD equals zero. That's rude. Uh, This final letter ended, quote, me equals 37, SFP equals zero. Meaning in his final letter, now he's claiming 37 deaths as his, you know, that he's responsible for. Over the years, there have been other letters received that have never been proven to specifically be from Zodiac himself. While many contain similar wording and phrasing, their authenticity is in question, and we do know that people are fucking monsters and they will prank with stuff like that, you know? Mm-hmm. So you can just yeah. never know. I don't understand why people look at all the things that we we've seen you can do with your time. Why you got to do something like that with your time? Mm-hmm. Like, I don't know. So let's talk about some suspects. 
Arthur Lee Allen is probably the most popular suspect. He was interviewed by police in the early days of the Zodiac investigation and had been served with search warrant several times. In 1969, he was interviewed and was reported to be in the vicinity where Brian Hartnell and Cecilia Shepard were attacked at Lake Berryessa, and he claimed to be scuba diving in the area on the day of the attack. Is that just, like, something that you just go and do one day? Like, yeah, Wednesday I go scuba diving. I'm... I guess. I'm petrified of scuba diving. I had a panic attack when I went on an excursion and GTFO'd out of there and sat on the beach while my husband went and did like an hour long scuba. So I don't, I don't know. That shit was scary. Are you in an OFT? Yeah. I got eight feet down yeah. and was like, nope, nope, nope. I'm not going any further than this. Get me the f out of here. Was it like, um, what was the feeling? Like claustrophobia. Like, I was like, I was eight feet yeah. down, and I was like forty feet. Not happening for me. I just felt like you go forty mm-hmm. feet and down. That's an introductory dive. Children do that, <laughs> and I was trying to tell myself the whole Dude. time: little kids do this. I can do this. I'm a grown up. I can do this. It's safe because they wouldn't let little kids do it if it wasn't safe. And I would just all I could think about was like it's just closed in around me. I feel like I'm in a submarine. What if I can't get out? What if my thing? swings out. I couldn't clear my mask of water. You have to do that before you go down. I don't know. It was too much. I got out of there. So anyway, I don't know. I don't Some really people blame you. I mean, out. that's, well, listen, I mean, it's kind of like you can't talk your mind out of being scared when you're already in the feeling. Like there's no talking yourself off that ledge. That's how it is with needles for me. If I watch it or sometimes if, if I even think about what is happening, then I'll just like fade in and out of consciousness. It's ridiculous. But I know I'm like, you're not going to die. Everything is fine. You're, you're going to make it through this. But in my mind, I'm like, no, yeah. absolutely not. Thank so you, anxiety. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. But okay, so he, a few years. I'm sorry. Ago, if he, if, if it was him, which I mean, we know it's not, but if it was him and he'd been scuba diving that day, I know you wear like wetsuits and stuff, but would he be wet? Like, I don't know. It just. His hair would be wet, right? I mean, you would think, so I don't know. It just seems like, um, like, Brian Hartnell didn't describe, like, the man being wet or, um, because we know he carried his costume with him, like, he didn't change out of a wetsuit into the, you know, he was wearing, like, regular clothes, like, I don't know. Not to say that he couldn't have changed his car or anything like that, but I don't know, just interesting. Yeah, it is interesting, but... A few years later, Alan would show up on investigators' radar again when a friend reported him for talking about a desire to kill people using the name Zodiac and getting a flashlight to secure it to a gun for use at night. And the friend claimed that this conversation happened before January 1st, 1969. I'm sorry, where was this information um, on July 4th, 1969, when the second attack happened? Like, why are you bringing this information up years later and because zodiac was the biggest case in the world at that time so there's no way this guy had never heard of it so you're gonna wait a couple years and be like actually he told me that he wanted to use the name zodiac that he had a flashlight that he could attach to his gun and he knew how to do that um he has zodiac stuff all over his place he has a watch with a zodiac symbol on it and also he has an interest um in killing and he actually said i'm pretty sure he said he that the verbiage that he used was that he wanted to kill little kitties as they came off a school bus. I mean, but the weird thing is it wasn't him. No, I don't I don't know that this ever happened. Because right. why would you you're only using information that is available to the public, you know? And why would you wait that mm-hmm. many years to do it when there's no way you didn't know about this case for years before that? Wouldn't that flag yeah, in your mind? Actually, Arthur said all that same shit to me a couple of years ago. Like, I don't know. It'd be like me being like, well, yeah, Torella definitely was saying some weird stuff. We had a conversation um, and she totally, she she said something about, um, about liking to wear costumes in parks. Mm-hmm. And, and and dressing up as an executioner with a zodiac symbol on it specifically probably not related though so right now that i'm thinking about it though mm-hmm. yeah no, i don't know no, it's very yeah. very strange in 1974 alan was arrested and convicted of sexually assaulting a 12 year old boy he served two years in prison perfect two That's great two i bet he never went on to uh sexually assault anybody ever again either No, he learned his lesson. Two years all took. 
Arthur Lee Allen died in 1992, and in July of 1992, Michael Majot picked Allen out of a photo lineup saying, that's him, that's the man who shot me. One of the officers who saw him flee, the Paul Stein crime scene said that Allen weighed at least 100 pounds more than the man that he saw. And I don't know if he meant the- that, like, do we know that at the time Allen weighed that much more? Or, I mean, it, none of it matters, but I don't know. Anyway, he says definitely. Right. He's he was too heavy. Right. Yeah, I don't I'm not I'm unsure about all of that. I don't know. In 2002, a DNA profile was made from the saliva pulled from the stamps that the Zodiac sent, and the profile was tested against Allen, and it was not a match. A retired handwriting expert was given boxes of samples of Allen's handwriting, and after comparing it to the letters received from Zodiac, concluded that Allen was not Zodiac. Uh, Coupled with the DNA results, Allen was officially ruled out as a suspect, although many investigators involved still believe that he was a Zodiac killer. Didn't they also check his fingerprints against the finger, some of the fingerprints that they found as well? And those also yeah. didn't match. Like, yeah, nothing, nothing has matched. It's not though. just like the handwriting, because that could be dicey. Like you could, you could use your left hand if you're right handed or you could, you know, um, it wasn't just one thing. It was a lot of things that ruled mm-hmm. him out. So, yeah. Investigators also compared the fingerprint they took from the payphone to Ted Bundy's fingerprints. Not a match. At one point, Ted Kaczynski was investigated after as possibly being the Zodiac killer, but he was ruled out with fingerprint and handwriting analysis. And members of the Manson family were also investigated, but eventually eliminated as well. In October of 2021, a team of 40 cold case investigators consisting of former law enforcement, military intelligence officers, and journalists claimed that Gary Francis Post was the Zodiac killer. Post died in 2018 at the age of 80. The team claimed that they had uncovered forensic evidence and photos from Post's own darkroom, and they claimed that Post had scars on his forehead that matched the Zodiac. The FBI stated that the case of the Zodiac Killer remains open and there is no new information to report. Many say that the case against Post is largely circumstantial and that there are no eyewitness accounts that even mention Zodiac having scars on his forehead. To this day, Zodiac has never officially been identified or arrested, and as we stated at the beginning, it remains one of the most notorious unsolved cases in the U.S. and around the world. We've literally only scratched the surface of everything that's available in this case. Like, like Torella said, I mean, you could go on like a seven day bender of just looking at Zodiac stuff. You could longer, you could, you could make your entire life out Mm -hmm. of it. But if you do want to dive into the case yourself, Zodiac by Robert Graysmith is a great place to start. It's a book. There are also, like Torella said, several podcasts that you can watch um, out there that go over that go over the case in several parts and episodes, or if you're more in the mood for a docudrama type deal, Zodiac released in 2007 stars Jake Gyllenhaal, Robert Downey Jr., and Mark Ruffalo, and it tells the story of Zodiac. Um, And it was based in part on the book written by Robert Graysmith. So if you just need more Zodiac. Jake Gyllenhaal plays one of the, is he at the Chronicle? It's a the journalist, mm-hmm. I think. Yeah. Yeah. So. He's like the cartoonist for the Chronicle. Oh, okay. Okay. I forget. And he's trying to like uh, translate the cipher. Yeah. I couldn't get into that movie, yeah. but it's out there. I agree. I tried to rewatch it or watch it maybe for the first time last night. And I was like, oh, no, that's what I really don't know. Yeah. I don't know. Got halfway through and I was yeah. like, I've, I've done but enough But there's literally no shortage um, of stuff you can watch on it. There's a show on HLN, which I watched on Hulu, called Very Scary People. God, I love. With, I love HLN and I love Very Scary yeah, People. Yeah, Donnie Wahlberg. It's a two-part. Mm-hmm. So there's two episodes on it. Um, there's just all kind of stuff out there for sure. A lot of them are two parts. They've got, I mean, they cover all kinds of people. Uh, very scary mm, very people. Scary. Um, but a lot of them are two parts. Yeah, I really like that show. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, there's it's endless. Yeah, so exactly. If you want it, you got it. It's out there. But thank you guys so much for hanging out with us. And if you're watching, thank you for watching. If you're listening, thank you for listening. And we hope that we will catch you on the next episode. But bye. bye.